but we really don't understand and don't know when an F5 tornado is going to occur. I was watching the radar and seeing these cells come together. You knew something bad was going to happen. I could clearly see a whole tree that was floating through the air. It had been ripped out and it was you know, circling the tornado. While I was taping, it was almost like it wasn't really real because I was just watching it on TV. When debris was falling down on the highway, we knew that homes were getting destroyed, probably people were getting hurt or killed. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. Not all tornadoes are created equal. Some tear off shingles. Others rip apart houses brick by brick down to their foundations. And the most powerful, the dreaded F5s, can flatten entire towns. No matter how strong, tornadoes are terrifying, and most people avoid them. But Josh Worman isn't most people. He's a storm researcher who looks for danger in order to find safety. We want to understand the process of tornado formation better so that we can make better predictions. May 1999. Josh is director of the Center for Severe Weather Research. He and his team of scientists in Oklahoma have a clear mission to solve the mystery of why tornadoes form. We know the broad strokes, that you need a rotating thunderstorm, but we don't know why two-thirds of rotating thunderstorms don't produce tornadoes. Truth be told, Josh is a bit of a tech head with a PhD in meteorology. And this is his baby. It started as a Ford F700 truck. But in 1995, Josh made it over into a Doppler on wheels, or Dow. They're big antennas, big pedestals, big hydraulics, and really first-class radar systems with pretty new computers put on trucks. It really was more of a feat of chutzpah than of rocket science to take these big instruments and try to get them up closer to tornadoes. To withstand those punishing conditions, the Dows had to be built tough. The skepticism in the field was that our trucks would tip over, that we couldn't keep computers operating while we're bouncing down the road and crossing railroad tracks, things like that. But the Dow survived and revolutionized storm research. And on May 3rd, 1999, they're about to make history. It's 2 p.m. Josh meets up with his friend and fellow researcher, Herb Stein. Herb is perfect for the job of driving the Dow. He's obsessed with storms and immune to pressure. You have uh, different tasks at hand as you're driving, but the ultimate goal is safety of the, the crew and the truck. We drive in some of the worst conditions that anybody can drive in, with winds blowing 80, 100 miles an hour, torrential rain, near zero visibility, hail sometimes smashing the windshields. The team sets off for Tornado Alley. This stretch of the Great Plains from northern Texas to Nebraska is the birthplace of almost 40% of tornadoes in the United States. Southeasterly winds come up from the Gulf of Mexico and bring warm, moist air up into Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, the main part of Tornado Alley. And waves containing high wind from the west flow over those southeasterly winds that are bringing warm moisture up from the Gulf. What all storm trackers seek is the F5 the most violent tornado known. Less than one-tenth of one percent of all tornadoes earns that title. The ranking was developed in the 1970s by meteorologist Tetsuya Fujita. The Fujita scale looks at the damage after a tornado hits, then ranks it from zero to five. Each number on the scale corresponds to a range of estimated wind speeds. The reason for this after-the-fact measurement it's been difficult or even impossible to clock wind speeds during a tornado. Until Josh and his Dows came along. 
We literally see thousands of times better data than we can see from further away. Today's mission involves two DAOs, each with a radar operator, a navigator, and a driver. We thought May 3rd would be a down day, but I remember vividly waking up in the morning and we had high dew points and a wind screaming out of the south and I got excited. I thought, this sounds like it could be a chase day after all. For hours, the Dows follow an ominous storm system moving from the southwest toward Oklahoma City. Then, that determination pays off. It's just like magic. Uh, the storms were starting to fire. And shortly after their formation, they began to produce tornadoes. The Dows stalk the system as it cycles through several small tornadoes. Now, I don't get to see much of the tornado visually because I'm back in the radar truck and I just have a bank of computer screens in front of me. At 6.30, near the town of Amber, a massive twister spins to life. With the radar information keeping the trucks just outside of danger, the crews follow the tornado 15 miles up the interstate. The tornado was extremely violent and at least a mile wide, and we pulled into a rest stop to collect some data, and we were perhaps just 500 yards from the edge of the tornado. What I saw was probably even more spectacular because in the radar screen, we saw this big, clear donut eye in the center of this fairly large tornado. Up in the driver's seat with the video camera, Herb has a better view of the outside world. I could clearly see a whole tree that was floating through the air. It had been ripped out and it was you know, circling the tornado. Josh and Herb know the tornado is powerful, but they can't be sure of its Fujita rating until damage is assessed. We thought perhaps the winds were up at F3 intensity. In a matter of minutes, though, they realize they might be wrong. The Dows roll into the town of Moore, just behind the tornado. I remember looking out and seeing trees that were like stumps and shredded. And the smell of gas was permeating everywhere because all these gas lines, these meters, had been sheared off. Thousands of homes are destroyed. 36 people are dead. The only consolation, Josh knows it could have been worse. Many, many, many more homes were destroyed than people killed. And the reason for that is because people had such a good warning of this event. People knew half an hour or an hour ahead of time that this tornado was coming towards their area. Josh reviews the data from the May 3rd tornado and discovers the top wind speeds reached an extraordinary 301 miles an hour. The winds were clearly of F5 intensity, and in fact, on careful analysis, they were the highest winds that anybody had ever seen. The recorded measurement of those winds will earn Josh and his team a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records. But their real goal is to help get earlier and more accurate warnings to people in the path of tornadoes. I think the public's reaction to warnings depends on where they live, People in the center of Tornado Alley usually take tornado warnings pretty seriously. That's not the case everywhere. Coming up on Storm Stories, what happens when F5s hit outside Tornado Alley? It just came out of nowhere. And it's not even a little one. It's a big tornado from Wisconsin. Unlike hurricanes, which make landfall along ocean coasts, deadly twisters are equal opportunity disasters. No place in the United States is safe. Tornadoes can occur in almost any state, and some of those tornadoes can be the worst tornadoes, the F5 ones. Helen Duby is mayor of Wheatland, Pennsylvania, a small industrial community 60 miles northwest of Pittsburgh and hundreds of miles from Tornado Alley. In the early evening of May 31st, 1985, weather warnings flash across the local news. This is a Newswatch 27 weather advisory. A severe thunderstorm warning has been issued. But like most of the town's residents, Helen and her husband paid little attention. Pennsylvania isn't noted for tornadoes. 
Tonight, that changes. At 7 p.m., the doobies hear a roar. An F-5 rips through the center of town, just missing Helen's house. But the industrial district is not as fortunate. I went down to the disaster area, and uh, we had called the um, governor, and he declared it a state of emergency, and he called the National Guard out. The tornado leaves seven people dead, and the local economy in ruins. In a town of 1,100 people, 500 jobs are lost. How it picks and chooses its path, only the good Lord knows. The Wheatland tornado was the first recorded F-5 to touch down in Pennsylvania, but there's no guarantee it's the last. We lost our innocence, and it'll always be gone. Before 1985, many Pennsylvanians believed the mountains would protect them from deadly tornadoes. In southwest Minnesota, some residents made a similar mistake. What everyone thought was, because there's this ridge outside of town, that if any tornadoes approached from the west, they'd run into the ridge and it would disrupt the wind pattern and basically the tornado would die out. June 16th, 1992. Meteorologist Jay Trobeck has a terrible feeling about the weather system that's arrived in his region. You knew something bad was going to happen sometime because we had a lot of heat, we had a lot of humidity. It was just a question of when the storms are going to come and take all that out of the air. So that was the day. Jay is a news reporter and weekend weatherman at KELO TV in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But in this warm, late spring afternoon, almost no one is talking about the weather. The big news is the local election. I was actually scheduled to fill in uh, helping out with election coverage from the anchor desk. And about in the middle of the afternoon, I got a phone call from one of our engineers. And we heard this terrible racket over the phone as hailstones were hitting his windows and breaking out the windshield of his car. And he was screaming about the, how bad it was. Jay checks the radar and discovers his instinct about the storm is right. I saw two supercells which looked like they were coming toward each other and I had a really bad feeling because I knew at least one of those supercells was very strong and my concern was that somebody in South Dakota right near the Minnesota border was going to get hammered by this uh, big storm. He urges his assignment editor to let him follow the supercells. I said, can I go with somebody in a car? drive north. I said, if nothing happens, we'll be back before the polls close. I'll be back in plenty of time to help anchoring the uh, election coverage. And I said, uh, you know, if uh, what I think is going to happen happens, nobody will care about the election. But when Jay and a cameraman reached the area where Jay thought the storms would collide, the supercells have moved east into Minnesota. So I said, okay, fine. We tried. We thought something was going to happen. I said, turn around and we'll come back to Sioux Falls and cover the election. Just then, their vehicle scanner snaps to life. We hear this woman's voice come on the air, and she said, this is Lake Wilson. We've been flattened by a tornado. Send everything you've got. Jay and the cameraman race 65 miles to Lake Wilson, Minnesota, which has taken a terrible hit. And from there, the news gets worse. People said to us, as bad as it is in Lake Wilson, it's even worse at Chandler. They drive five miles to Chandler, and Jay reports from the scene. Right now, we've got a, we're still in the midst of another storm here, Steve. We've seen wave after wave come through. Lightning, thunder, heavy winds. You could see homes were removed from foundations. It did F5 damage on the Fujita scale, which means that it produced winds estimated in excess of 260 miles an hour. Jay Trobeck followed his instinct to an F5 twister in a most unlikely place. For a young storm chaser in Wisconsin, it was strictly a matter of luck. Central Wisconsin isn't a hot spot for tornado activity. Still, the Midwestern state northeast of Tornado Alley sees enough action to keep things interesting. That is, unless you're 14 years old. 90% of storm chasing is boring. You drive around, you look at the clouds, and nothing happens. But on July 18th, 1996, all that changes for Jesse Lloyd and his family. The Lloyds have been chasing storms for years. And even though Jesse's unimpressed with the family hobby, 
he's recruited to run the video camera. After zigzagging across central Wisconsin for about three hours, the Lloyds catch up with a fierce thunderstorm near Oakfield, 10 miles from their home in Fond du Lac. You expect these things just to disappear right away because that's what usually happens. But instead, this one blew up into a massive tornado. And from there, I just started video recording. Yes? Are you still filming? I, mean, I, I, got, I can see it on the tape. Tornado on the ground. This is only the second time Jesse's been the cameraman, but he keeps a steady hand. For anybody that actually does see the original tape, you'll know that I was so scared that I just stayed still. <laughs> you know, it was almost like it wasn't really re real because I was just watching it on TV. But when bits of insulation and wood start raining down on them, the Lloyds realize the severity of the situation. We are in Oakfield. It went through Oakfield. Probably yep. major damage. Okay. We saw a bunch of debris that was floating in the air. But we didn't realize that this thing was so massive. We didn't actually until the next day realize that it was an F5 tornado. That's when they learned that 12 different tornadoes passed through the region and the F5 ravaged Oakfield. No one was killed, but the danger left a permanent impression on Jesse and his siblings. After that, none of us, I don't think, went storm chasing again. It's kind of like once you see something like that, the possibility of seeing it again is pretty minuscule. One F5 tornado was enough for Jesse Lloyd. But on May 3rd, 1999, it's only the beginning for Josh Worman and Herb Stein. The men already have captured the fastest tornado wind speeds ever recorded. They have no way of knowing that another world record is ahead of them. We still had about four supercells in and around central Oklahoma. They all had tornado warnings on them, and we were debating, do we call it a night? But we went on to catch another tornado in the dark, which was even bigger. May 3rd, 1999, Josh Worman and Herb Stein close in on yet another major tornado in northern Oklahoma. They stop their Doppler on wheels in Mulhall. Night has fallen, and the menace in front of them is nearly invisible. Every so often we'd see a flash of lightning and we see this giant wedge coming down from the thunderstorm. And I kept checking my radar to make sure I wasn't making a mistake. I couldn't believe it was that big. This tornado was four and a half times as large as the one that we had just seen devastate more in Oklahoma City. It's large, though. It's, it's a monster. It's, 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 it's like got a kilometer wide in circulation. Oh, at least. It is huge. It's a monster. This monster is right in front of them, but hidden in the dark. Only lightning and the radar reveal its existence. It probably was the scariest tornado that I had ever deployed on because not only was our first nighttime intercept, but this was the largest tornado ever measured before. And it was one of the strongest. It was a very powerful tornado. With two new world records under their belts, Josh and Herb drive across the battered landscape toward home. The events of the day finally sink in. I remember being half dazed as I drove home. And I just sat in the street in the car and I turned on the fine arts and I remember there was this, this uh, Brahms piece was playing and it was just so sweet and so decompressing and it just like emotion started to pour out. Usually when we're on missions tracking tornadoes, we get very divorced from the human aspect of what's happening. And sometimes we're reminded of the personal cost of tornadoes. The cost to Oklahoma on May 3rd, 1999 was astronomical. 60 tornadoes tore across the state, leaving 40 people dead. Property damage exceeded a billion dollars. It's that kind of loss that drives Josh and Herb in their search for a better warning system. What the whole scientific tornado community is doing is focused at trying to understand the process of tornado formation better and then answer the more difficult questions. Is this going to be a strong tornado? Is this going to be a long track tornado? When is this tornado going to form and when is it going to die? We're collecting very unique data which hopefully can be applied toward 
better understanding of storms and tornadoes, and ultimately, this would help mankind. How is it possible for a tornado with 300 mile an hour winds to be classified F zero? The answer when Storm Stories returns. So, how is it possible for a tornado with 300 mile an hour winds to be classified F zero? The Fujita scale classifies tornadoes by the damage they leave behind. If a 300 mile an hour tornado touches down in an empty field, there can be little or no damage. Therefore, it could be classified as an F zero despite its strong winds. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next.